Hello everyone and welcome back to another Andy Devo guide video for Blood Bowl 3. Today's offering, Dwarves. In this guide video I'm going to cover several different topics. We're going to start by looking at the players individually, then I'm going to build on top of that and we'll give you the level ups in terms of best ways to level the team. After that I'm going to give you all the rosters that you can choose for Dwarves, then we're going to move on to uh, setups, both offensive and defences. I will also give you some strategy in terms of how to play them overall, try the best out of them. And then finally, we'll close off and we'll look at inducements and what inducements you should pick and what ones you should avoid. Little introduction to dwarves. A lot of people will say, Andy, why dwarves? And that is a good question. Why dwarves? Why should anyone want to play dwarves? Um, dwarves are a very Marmite team. People will either love them or will hate them. And that's because they exist in a competitive environment. And from a balanced perspective, on the one hand, I think they are actually reasonably balanced uh, in a lot of places. Unfortunately, the reason that the, they don't receive an awful lot of love in some quarters is they force the game of Blood Bowl to be played very much in a two-dimensional space, which is a slow, grindy game. Uh, no matter what team they're playing into, that is their game style and they will, they will force that onto their opponents. So if you like a control game and if you like uh, positioning, then these, this team will be for you. It will not be a team that has got a lot of flair, you won't be passing the ball, you won't be doing anything interesting, you will just be very carefully and methodically placing your players across the pitch. And with that in mind, let's go and look at the players. Right, so Dwarves have actually got five different positionals. However, they have four standard positionals uh, and then a very special player, which we'll come to at the end. Um, first of all, we're going to talk about Troll Slayers, probably my favourite player on the Dwarf team, and that is a movement five, strength three player, uh, who's not particularly agile, dodging on a 4+, plus, uh, and is also, for a Dwarf, not very well armoured, uh, only armour 9+. plus. However, the reason I like him so much uh, is because he starts with block, and he also starts with my favourite skill, Frenzy. So a block Frenzy player that's movement 5, uh, and then also, if he's want to take on big things, he's got Dauntless. Dauntless lets you roll a, a d6 dice to see if you can equalise your strength with anyone who's higher than you. So, very, very good at taking down things like biggins uh, or even potentially trolls. Uh, the simple simple way to remember Dauntless is for every one point of strength your opponent is higher than you, it's plus one on the dice. So if you're taking a strength uh, four player on, it's just a two plus. If you're taking a strength five player on, it's a three plus and so on and so forth. In terms of how to level a, uh, the troll slayers then, they are primarily your blitzers on the team, although they don't actually, call, they're not called blitzers. And as such, I think that they are very good uh, at taking Mighty Blow as their first skill uh, on both of them. You're allowed two. Then after that, I think that they also uh, do very well to take Tackle uh, so that they can actually knock over whatever they're hitting. Uh, other people will also suggest very early on their, uh, in their skill trees that you actually look at the Guard skill. And I think this is a very wise uh, assumption because... Dwarves as a team are actually, everybody is strength three and the, their functionality, the way that they operate really is that we have more guard than you, you can't fight us. So giving uh, a dwarf troll slayer guard even on a second skill after Mighty Blow is actually not bonkers because it helps the team function more as a unit. One of the other things to talk about troll slayers uh, is whether you should take non, one or two players and actually I think different people will tell you different things. Because they're my favourite player, I always take two. That doesn't necessarily make it right. Um, realistically, you probably actually only want one Troll Slayer uh, in the optimal builds because of their armour value. Uh, and Dwarves also, alongside their I have more guard than you metra, is that we're also better armoured than you and therefore we're okay to have a fight. Well, trading out some of that armour value actually can get you into trouble because people will target the Troll Slayers and they will try and get at them. Uh, do consider probably only taking the one. I, I think it's also a mistake to not take any because adding a frenzy player into your team does add a, a little bit of extra control and it is also a very good blitzer and he helps deal with the uh, the higher strength teams, which is actually what dwarves are famously bad against. You know, lizard men, orcs, chaos, those sorts of teams. They do always struggle with those types of team. Past those three skills in terms of uh, taking mighty blow, tackle and guard, um, you're then into the luxu luxury skills and at that point, Break Tackle doesn't do it for you anymore. I think Juggernaut absolutely is a great skill. Uh, Stand Firm is also a very good skill because you will be going near the sidelines. So consider these as your sort of second tier of skills that you might want to go to. You can't have Grab because you've already got Frenzy. And then Brawler and Armbar, probably not so much because people won't be dodging away from you particularly. So I think after I'd got the core three, uh, we want to be looking at Juggernaut and Stand Firm 
uh, as other core skills. We jump into the agility tree, um, skills that used to get taken, uh, which are dodge, jump up, they're okay, but I don't think that now you can pick skills, I would just stay away from uh, the secondaries on this player and just take the core skills. Finally, talking about either randoming or characteristics. Characteristics I would absolutely strongly avoid because the Dwarf so Troll Slayer's starting stat line is not great. If you stick plus strength on him, well, the Dauntless becomes slightly less good. So let's avoid that. And uh, movement 5 up to movement 6 isn't good enough. And increasing your armor value is also not particularly helpful. So I would just avoid characteristics. Um, and from a randoming point of view, if you had enough time... I think you can actually random quite well on the uh, on the strength tree here because that's great, that's great, and these two are both fine. So you've got a four in or oh, four in ten chance of actually picking up. Uh, sorry, a four in nine chance because you can't get strong arm. You've already got thick skull that doesn't exist yet. So you've got a four in nine chance of picking a good skill. That's actually pretty good, but I would only random it the one time once you've got one of these, and you are trading out, not getting mighty blow. Next, we go on to the Blitzers. Blitzers are also movement 5, so you're starting to notice that this team is not a particularly fast team when your core positionals are both movement 5. We've got Strength 3 again. We've got an Agility 3 plus player, so add a pinch, can dodge or pick up the ball. Uh, and these are your secondary ball carriers. We've got a passing of 4 plus, which is terrible. Armor value 10 plus, which is staple for a normal dwarf. They've got block and they've also got thick skull. Um, and you'll notice that we've got passing as a secondary. Actually, we will never step into this tree ever. Um, so don't ever look at this tree. Just because we've got it, it doesn't do anything for us. From a leveling up point of view, uh, it's more of the same really. Mighty Blow and Guard are the two absolute staples for this player. Also Stand Firm is very strong. And then after that, oddly enough, uh, although we have got Tackle on a lot of other players, Tackle is also a considered skill. I think that it would actually just stray into the, uh, into the Strength Tree and I would just take Guard and then Mighty Blow. Um, and at 16 star player points, this player's broadly done. If I did level him again, then I would take stand firm. At that point, you can then start looking at break tackle because you're dodging on a 3+, plus, so dodging down onto a 2+, plus from a break tackle isn't too bad. But we're now talking about a player that's aiming at their fourth level up, um, and this is probably outside the scope of this guide. So start with these two, and then move on to stand firm. From a stats point of view, again, I don't think these players are particularly good. Um, although I have seen people fish for an agility increase or a strength increase uh, and then see what they get. Uh, the problem with this player is if you don't get uh, an agility or a strength, you are left looking at a double skill and you don't really want anything from this tree either. Unless, of course, you're going to go guard, stand firm and dodge, which as a combination is quite interesting uh, and quite good. You do need to try and get a couple of players with defensive on this team as well. So you could argue that defensive on the blitzers makes sense because they're the most mobile and you can put the defensive where you want to put it. Ultimately, I think uh, defensive actually sits on any three or four players that actually get to the point where they've already got guard, they've already got stand, um, mighty blow, and then you're trading either stand firm or defensive because you will need it. Onto the runners. So the runners are the fastest player on the team. And yes, I did say fastest at movement six. Their fastest player is average speed. Uh, their strength, si uh, strength three, their agility three plus. So they're dodging on a three and picking up the ball on a three. They're also passing four plus. So nobody on a dwarf team is passing on a, uh, an, a on a good passing stat at all. Dwarves are a running team. And they're AV nine plus, which again is actually quite low for a dwarf team. And this is one of the reasons why we don't potentially only take one of the runners uh, initially, or we only take one troll slayer because then we've only got two AV9 plus players on the field and everybody else will be AV10 plus. Uh, they do have thick skull, which helps them keep them on the field. And then they have the sure hand skill, uh, which is great for allowing them to pick the ball up initially. You are allowed two of these and ultimately you only need, need one as your actual runner to carry the ball. So let's talk about that one first of all. Um, I think we want to take block as an immediate skill so that your player is a lot more reliable. And then... After that, we want to step into here uh, in the passing tree and take on the ball. On the ball allows you to have to kick off and move three squares towards the ball wherever that went. And that means effectively on turn one, you've got a movement nine player for free. And then potentially with two go for it, you've got movement 11. Dwarves absolutely need to get their, their ball carrier inside a cage on turn one as much as possible. And therefore, I think block and on the ball are the absolute core skills. If you think you won't get your hit, ball carrier hit too much, I'd actually open with on the ball because it is that powerful and it does make such a difference to your drives. Rounding it out, I think lead is a really nice skill. 
And if you really want to try and pass, then you can try and fix this horrendous passing stat by leaning into the characteristics, taking a characteristic increase, get the passing increase down, then take accurate. And actually you might have yourself a, a second dimension uh, for a dwarf team, which is some form of limited passing skill. I don't think it's great, but I think it possibly could work. Uh, a skill I haven't seen taken very much in Blood Bowl at all, because the meta hasn't caught up with itself yet, uh, is Fumlaruski. And that means that you could potentially try and move the ball really quickly uh, with a dwarf team um, where you're running two runners. One runs forward, puts the ball down, another run runs off. Um, and it would save you a handoff because you've got sure hands on both runners. I don't think it's great. And I think you need to combine Fumlaruski with a passing action uh, and dwarves can't pass. So uh, I don't think it's a good idea, but someone might want to experiment with it. Back to trying to round this player out. Uh, on the ball and block your core skills. And then I would go fishing for a stat increase. Movement's brilliant. And I would actually save up for two stat increases. And you're actually fishing for a double move increase so that you've got movement eight. That really would round this player out fantastically. Um, if you hit agility, brilliant. That makes picking the ball up a lot better. That also makes dodging a bit better. So I would, I would go start looking for stats. And a strengthful ball carrier is nothing to sniff at either. So go and look for stats. Any of those three are great. On the ball and block would be where I would put in my players, uh, star player points. And then finally, uh, the leader skill for a free reroll uh, re helps the team out, but not as much, I don't think, as an increased movement. The final player, and this is one of the most divisive uh, players, and it's because of its starting uh, skills, and they are block and tackle. So block is the best skill in the game at low team value, and tackle is probably a B tier skill uh, after block being an A tier skill. Uh, and so you get both of those for free, at the start they also have obscene general strength access so you're building already on a very good player and putting uh, probably strength which is guard uh, we'll jump into this tree we'll talk about that now so you're going to put guard on this player at six star player points there's nothing else you need to put on this player after that he is complete at six star player points which is bonkers you can make him better absolutely right mighty blow is great that stops your opponents then standing in the getting in the way. It allows you to add a, you know, a lot of firepower and massed mighty blow will start to cause results. They do very well with stand firm. So once they got into a scrum, they don't get kicked back out again. And then where we thought from a balance perspective, they should have gone is they should have given them on bar and they should have lost tackle so that um, you can still get stuck in. But you've now got to actually pick tackle as a skill rather than just get it for free. In the general skill tree, uh, Pro is not a terrible ch skill choice because it allows you to reroll blocks, but I think it's a secondary skill. So I would basically stay in the primary skill tree. You're looking for guard at six points, mighty blow, then stand firm. And then uh, in here, we are looking at a defensive or two just to make sure that your opponent's guard isn't working while yours is. And actually that'll add an awful lot of defense, uh, defensive to your team and mean that you'll, not, you'll take even less damage. Now, downsides. Unfortunately, the movement four... They are average strength. They also don't dodge very well. They're terrible at passing, but they are really well armoured. So armour 10 plus combined with thick skull means they don't leave the field other than about 3% of the time um, when they get hit. So it, it's an incredible um, player from a resilience point of view. And that's why you can just throw them in over and over again and expect them to not leave the field uh, and still be stood there. Uh, from a characteristics point of view, I would absolutely avoid taking characteristics. I don't think moving up to movement 5 is worth it. Strength 4, while on Blob Ball 2, was great. It is incredibly unlikely now. So unless you want to save up for a characteristic and then potentially be okay with taking defensive when you don't hit strength, then that's okay. If redraft was in, I think you'd be saving for characteristics a lot. At the moment, Blob Ball 3 doesn't support redrafting. So I would say that you need to stay away from characteristics. We don't want to touch the passing stat. Taking armor value from 10 to 11 doesn't seem to make sense. So ultimately, no passing. And again, in this skill tree, you could start arguing that you're going to try random, but you're only really looking for those two skills there, guard and mighty blow, uh, with potentially stand firm as a, as a third skill. Uh, that makes it a slightly less attractive option from a randoming point of view than it might do for a blitzer, for example, because you don't want juggernaut. So you've got to be careful whether or not you actually take that. I, I would avoid randoming. And I would just just take guard. Save up the extra couple of star player points and just take guard. Right, on to the very final player on this roster. And this is a death roller. The death roller is just some sort of giant lawnmower. <clears throat> but unfortunately, it's got a hell of a lot of skills, which we'll go over in a second. First of all, the 
stat line of the player. It's also movement four, so it's incredibly slow. It's strength seven, so knocking it over is nine impossible. And it's also armor value 11, so even if you do knock it over, unless you've got claws, it's probably not leaving the field. It can't pass, so if it does intercept a bomb, then it'll just blow up, but never mind. And it's agility 5+, plus, so it isn't really dodging. Now, it's got a lot of skills over here, so let's cover off some of the, uh, the, the simple ones. First of all, secret weapon. This means this player is only going to play for one drive. The, dri the first drive you put it on the field, it is very likely to get sent off at the end of the drive. You can argue the call, so maybe on a 1 in 6 you're going to get to keep it, or you can... Uh, take bribes to support keeping this player on the field. It's also very expensive. So you're talking about a player that's super expensive, that's only going to play one drive. You really need to take bribes to keep this player around, or you need to have a full normal roster of 11 before you start considering a roller. However, it has some incredible upsides and potentially game-breaking upsides. This one here, Dirty Player Plus 2. So Dirty Player Plus 2 means that because the, the when you're fouling, God provides a guaranteed assist, and dwarves have a hell of a lot of guard, you can actually almost guarantee that you're going to get three, four, five, even potentially six assists on anybody. So now you're talking about fouling something with an effective armor value of you know, three or four. And then you get plus two on the dirty player on the actual injury roll. You can't split the dirty player plus one on, uh, on the armor and then plus one on the injury. It's just plus two on either and that's it. However, if you can get the plus two armor value, sorry, plus two dirty player on the injury roll, you're now lifting players off the field on a six plus dice roll on 2d6, which is insane. Unfortunately, we then peer into the skill accesses. It's got secondary skill access, sneaky git. So for a measly 12 star player points, which you can get by just blocking with him at the, first start, uh, the start of the first few games to cause casualties, um, you then got a sneaky get death roller that only gets sent off 15% of the time, but actually has a removal rate that sits at around 65% of the time. That is un very unbalanced, and this player uh, needs some attention from Games Workshop, uh, and it needs tuning downwards considerably. Um, I think the the removal of sneaky get, and I would argue the reduction of mighty player, dirty player plus two down to dirty player plus one would both go a long way. Uh, to fixing it. I think as an emergency hotfix, I would get rid of Sneaky Git on this player. You can do some interesting things with a de uh, with a Death Roller, uh, other than get break the game, and that is that also in the Agility Tree, we have Diving Tackle, and it's a Strength 7 um, Stand Firm player. You could then go and stand, uh, stick Diving Tackle on this player, and you go and put that against someone's ball carrier. They have no choice but to dodge away because you're Strength 7, and then... They can't dodge away because you've got Diving Tackle. You're turning people over left, right and centre at this point. And actually, it can be a very fun player to play, uh, not just a, a toxic removal machine. I don't think you need to go into dodge. I don't think anything else is particularly helpful in here. Even defensive, while can be useful, I think Diving Tackle is just more fun. And then normal skills, you absolutely want to be taking guard on this player immediately. And if you do want to go and actually play this player properly, then block. Because it's a, a standard player doesn't have block, you want to come in here and get block. Uh, it's worth noting that sticking Dirty Player plus 1 does not stack with Dirty Player plus 2 and you don't get effective Dirty Player plus 3, uh, so just bear that in mind. Uh, this skill is completely redundant um, and actually therefore the worst skill in the game for this player because it doesn't do anything. So that's the Dwarf team and that's how to level them up. Dive now into some rosters. Okay, when talking about rosters, as usual, I've got three different rosters for you, all built around something slightly different. Uh, the first one is this one here. This is the balanced roster and probably the one I would recommend you use. Uh, I've given yourself one Troll Slayer. We've got two Blitzers. We've got two Runners, so you've got redundancy in case one of them gets knocked over or removed. And then we've got Linemen down to 11. You'll notice that everybody here is a normal Dwarf. There's no Death Roller. I've given you also three rerolls, uh, And the very first thing you need to then pick up is an Apothecary. Once you got to an apothecary and 11, uh, 11 players, I don't really think you actually need to buy anything else uh, um, initially. If you want to try and add a little bit more safety, you could step to a 12th player. And in maybe a, a ladder format uh, or a league format, that'd be okay. In a league format, I'd go for another troll slayer, get yourself all your positionals. In a ladder format, I'd either stay at 11 players where team value is sensitive, or I would then uh, step it up to 12 players once I hit sort of 13 or 1400 team value. Um, and we're now looking for extra players to have guard. Like, this is my favourite roster, and I think it also demonstrates quite why Dwarves are so strong, because we've already got three rerolls, we've got all our positionals pretty much, uh, and we've got 11 players. There's no sacrifices here, this is just flat the best roster. However, 
There are always people who want to try and do different things with teams and get them outside the box. And so, let's go and have a look at the second roster. Uh, I've called this one the, uh, the Death Roller, although I've run out of letters. And so I've put the Death Roller into this roster. And to get the Death Roller in, I've had to sacrifice down a reroll, which is unfortunate. And then we are broadly playing with a movement four team. So nine of your 11 players are movement four. We've only got one runner. And we've only got one secondary ball carrier in case something happens to our runner. I don't think this is a good idea, but you could, if you knew we were going to get bribes for some reason, you could probably run this roster. It won't suffer very much attrition as almost the entire team uh, is AV10+. Plus. The one player that shouldn't get hit is an AV9+. Plus, and then you've got an AV11+. Plus. It will struggle in the second half of games because the roller has been kicked out, unless you've managed to work out somehow to get a bribe, or you can successfully argue the call. And I only actually put this roster in here just to demonstrate why you can't put a death roller in normally, rather than this be a recommended roster. This is not a recommended roster. Uh, next, we've got uh, the third roster, and this is actually changing it up a little bit. And the idea behind this roster is to give you a lot more armor value and not give you multiple players with armor value 9+. plus. So to do that, I've actually been able to give you uh, five dedicated fans. You have unfortunately got two re-rolls, uh, but we do have an apothecary. So if you wish, you could drop an apothecary and pick up that third re-roll. Uh, they are absolutely the same cost, so you can choose and match... Ma Mix and match that to your own heart's content. The roster is a bit slower than the balanced roster I showed you at the start because we've got from four down to 11 uh, as all movement uh, four players. We've only got two blitzers and we've only got one runner. You can, of course, sacrifice some dedicated fans and bring the armor value of these players down and by adding uh, an extra runner uh, or adding a troll slayer. But at the point you're doing that, you may as well just go back and pick roster one because the roster one actually does the whole thing a lot better. This roster is probably some form of min-max kind of build and you'll notice that the team value of the team is actually only 955 so you're starting to get inducements already if you wanted to you could drop the dedicated fans you'd still be at tv 955 but you'd have 50k in the bank you could start scumming and this is where dwarves get really dangerous because they're actually playing effectively off 900 team value thousand team value when a normal team starts you're now adding five skills those five skills are going to be guard and you're going to be way ahead of other teams so in a laddering environment, dwarves can become a major problem um, in terms of a balancing because when you start matching on team value and they're already super team value efficient, then that becomes a problem. I have been arguing myself uh, to make the whole lot of dwarves just more expensive and remove tackle here, but uh, that sits outside the scope of this video. And uh, if you do want to hear me talk about how you could actually make dwarves both more fun and more balanced, then come and say hello on my Twitch channel. I stream every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday from 7 p.m. UK time. I also stream on a weekend, Saturday and Sunday, from around about 5 p.m. UK time. Right, let's go and look at some setups. So this roster here, um, I wanted to show you uh, offensive setups. And because dwarves are so super vulnerable to a blitz, I've actually gone and built a death roller specific anti-blitz setup. Um, this player here is your ball carrier. It doesn't really matter where it is. Um, hopefully it's got on the ball. If it's got on the ball, you actually can set it up a little bit more towards the centre. If you don't have on the ball, I drag it backwards because my other runner is sat there. This shape here is to dissuade anyone from dodging through. I've only put three players on the line of scrimmage to match up the three that your opponent puts there. We've got a pair of players here, which are uh, a slayer and a lineman. And then to hold the absolute flank, uh, I've put a death roller in here. This is probably one of the best and strongest anti-blitz setups that is out there and it covers wherever the ball can go um, pretty much universally, but also makes it very difficult for your opponent to dodge through. Uh, this is a standard setup, and you'll recognize this from almost all the other guide videos. We've got the two ball carriers at the back. I've gone flat on the two wings, just tucked in against the, uh, the sideline. We've got five players there. It's still pretty good against the blitz because your opponent has to run all the way around the outside on, both, on either side, but it's not quite as effective and if you're playing into Skaven or you're playing into Pro Elves, one of your most dangerous points on the game is the kickoff and that you actually don't get to the ball first or you get turned over within a turn or two of the kickoff happening. Once you've got the ball snugly tucked up inside here with the cage wrapped around the back, um, you're not really going to lose the ball. You might not score because you might get stuck, but you're not going to get turned over. So this is your standard offensive drive. Right, now let's look at some defensive setups. Um, so this is my standard defensive width setup. This is probably quite good if you are looking at, for some reason, wanting to go and play a pressing game with dwarves. 
or you just want to control the field. If you've got a lot of guard and you think your opponent's going to spread out, then this helps you spread out uh, as well and means that you can go and press wherever the opponent might go. It's not quite anti-two-turn or anti-three-turn. It's too far forward for that. Uh, but it is a reasonably interesting setup and will give you a lot of flexibility on the first couple of turns. So I would say this setup is designed more for turn one, turn two, turn three, where you know you need to go and press into your opponent because you think they're going to um, mess around. On that, then go to the Chevron setup. This setup is probably more like an anti-two turn or anti-three turn. However, for a straight anti-two turn, this is actually too far forwards. Um, again, as I've discussed in a couple of the other guide videos, this Chevron sh shape here, because you're so slow, you will need to drop these back a little bit uh, if you're trying to set up some form of anti-two turn. Um, and not only have I seen chevrons being deployed like this, you could also start deploying uh, your dwarves uh, in some sort of roster that looks like that and same on the other side. And the idea is that yes, they might, they'll punch four or nine, but you will guarantee to have two and six to be able to respond uh, depending on um, what happens. Because we're playing dwarves, I've also had to include uh, and they're very boring. I've also had to include the boat formation, which is also in itself a very boring setup. What the, the what this does do for you in a in a serious manner is that it does protect your slightly more squidgy players. And uh, so I've put both the runners in here, as you'll see here, and I've also protected both troll slayers you've got there. The two blitzes are in the middle here, uh, which makes them uh, a little bit easier to move around. If you are running a, de a death roller, it would go on the line of scrimmage, and it'd be flanked by two players with guard, and that death roll itself. If you've got loads of skills on it, that's also going to have guard, uh, hopefully block as well. So that's all the roster formations. I hope that was helpful. Let's move on to the next section. Okay, let's talk dwarf strategy. Uh, in this section, I'm going to talk to you specifically about how to play the team and try and get a lot out of them. And the first thing I'm going to do is some general pointers. So general pointer number one, when we're looking at the roster here, you'll see that the movement on these players is, in, is, is slow. They are not a team that is going to outpace your opponent. So with that in mind, two things. Number one, make sure that you do not get knocked over needlessly because if a dwarf longman, longbeard has to stand up, it's going to be able to move one square the following turn. So if you are getting hit, or unless it's to take away that action point of that player, then getting knocked over is going to take you not this turn and it's going to spend your following turn doing nothing. So number one, weirdly, don't get hit. Number two, Again, referencing their movement speed, this team is not going to outpace and swing past an opponent. So if you suddenly, and we imagine here that number four is the ball carrier, if number four suddenly started its life there on a flank, again, let's assume it was inside a cage, but it was there, you're not going to be able to score because you can only go forwards or possibly into the centre. So staying central with dwarves is super duper important. Only commit uh, to a... Only commit to a sideline once you are absolutely certain you can score. So, building on top of that, you need to be trudging forwards in the middle of the field and arguing about the middle of the field as much as possible. Some more general pointers uh, with dwarves is the next thing you want to do is because hopefully you've skilled up your players with guard, um, you want to have them in a nice line like this and they want to be touching your opponent. So walk the entire line as one into your opponent. What you mustn't do is split them up into little groups of ones and twos and go and take you know, nine and seven and go and touch these two, you know, two players over here and then take six, 11 and go and touch these two players here. Go and take number two and just touch one player randomly there and put three or three against another random player there because your opponent will then go and stick an extra couple of players over here and knock over nine and seven or push them back. Three will get pushed back. One will get pushed back. And actually, you'll have gone nowhere. It's like spinning your wheels in mud you're not going to go anywhere. You need to use overwhelming firepower uh, against only a few players and just shove into them with absolutely everything you've got, knock them over, walk past them, go and find the rest of the opponent's team. And with that in mind, anytime you can take space, you should take it. And if you can walk some dwarves forwards, even on turns two, turn three, turn four, absolutely take it. Take space where you can and treat the dwarves as a big giant tank that just rolls over everybody. Now, if you split the two teams up into agility teams and strength teams, doing that to the agility teams is fairly trivial. You, know, you can take your big giant tank, shove them into a load of elves. The elves will have no guard. They won't have any strength. They won't be able to do anything. They'll just run away. So elves will play keep away. At that point, this is where your secondary skills, the mighty blows come in, because then you can start thinning out the herd and start actually then finding some gaps. And by the time you get to turn six, turn seven, you'll be fine. On the other end of the spectrum against strength teams, 
you will find that your giant tank is actually uh, fighting against another tank, which is Orcs with their massive four strength four players, possibly a strength five player, and also a good chunk of guard. So at this point, we need to start thinking about being uh, a bit more creative with our setups. So here I've put um, the runner, uh, which is number four, and I've got my other runner here, which is number five. Well, at that point, we do need to start thinking not about a cage, because we're playing against orcs, for example, but we need to start thinking about a screen. And so, if you start taking your runners and splitting them up a little bit, the defensive coach can see where number four can go, which is can run over here for six squares, it can run over there for six squares, or anywhere in the forward line. But also, it'll think, oh, hang on a second, we've got to defend against number five. And so, one, two, three, four, five, we can actually split these players up a little bit. And now, we're covering all of the board, which is, means that the Orcs have to cover all of the board in this example, and that will give you some space. And once you start pulling strength four players apart, your guard can then go in and slam three into one on a big one, for example. You will then be able to deal with that player, and you will create some space for yourself. So against the strength team, you need to move away from a cage, and you need to move into lines, and you want to separate the two runners. Now that's offense sorted. On defense... Uh, it's much more of the same uh, against the LV teams. They will try and play keep away. You need to go and press them. And this is where the runners then become your safeties. And you might actually start thinking about uh, having them here uh, on turns five and turn six. In the first couple of turns, everybody goes and piles in. So you end up with a line that looks like this. And then on the, the, the later turns, if you haven't stolen the ball, then the runners need to start dropping back because the uh, cheeky little elves will find some holes. They will get past your line. And then you need to go and sort them out. Against the strength team, um, they're not likely to run you know, past you with a little jinking attack. Um, so you should start life um, with a defensive team in the middle like this. Um, and I would recommend that you actually keep, keep this sort of shape. They then have to break around you. And then once you know where they've committed, your little dwarves uh, with their movement four are able to go one, two, three, four, and you can start trying to cut them off. The runners will be free to come and create um, a screen at the back. So you've, you've stopped them for one turn while all the little legs run four squares over here and then you're able to stop them. Dwarves are not likely to turn over a strength team uh, unless they've got overwhelming guard advantage. Um, but what they are looking to do is just stop them scoring. So favorite score on a dwarf team, one nil win. You scored on your drive on turn eight. They didn't score on their drive. That's totally fine. Hope that section helps. Uh, and if you've got any thoughts or you think I've missed anything, please slam it down in the comment section below. Uh, I really enjoyed the comments so far on all the guide videos. So um, I'm sure people have got a lot they want to add on this one. Thank you. Right, when looking at inducements, we've got three different uh, piles to pick from again. So we'll go through those in turn. I'm going to start with mercenaries. And on the mercenary side of things, realistically, the only things you'd be considering taking here are potentially uh, a dwarf block alignment with guard if you need one of those. Um, or more likely, you'll be stepping into here and trying to take the death roller and then combining that at 200k um, with um, a inducement, which is the bribe. And that gives you for 300k a dirty player plus two um, fouling machine, literally fouling machine, uh, that is very, very dangerous. That is one of the dwarves' um, strongest combos and definitely one that worries me from a matchmaking ladder perspective. Over in the inducement section overall, Bloodwiser kegs have incredibly limited value for dwarves because all of your players have got the thick skull skill, which cancels out half of the possibility of being KO'd in the first place. So I would say this has incredibly low value uh, and I would avoid it. Team rerolls, they only cost you 50k, you should just have the correct amount anyway. So again, this is an absolute no-no. Uh, wizards, yes, absolutely still have value. And depending on what you're looking to do, uh, I would take, I would, I would consider a wizard but not over a bribe. Bribes are absolutely amazing uh, because you've got so many different ways of actually maximizing and leveraging this bribe. You should consider bribes as one of your staple immediate picks. Um, I haven't got enough money in this particular example for a halfling master chef. Even if I did, it's garbage. Avoid it. Wandering Apothecary, again, your armor value is so high. You shouldn't need that. The only time you'd be thinking about taking a Wandering Apothecary is if you are playing in a league match and you just don't want to lose the, the team or the player. So, that, that's an absolute no apart from a niche circumstance. This is just chaff filler. And the biased referee uh, is great if you think you're going to be playing into something that's fouling. Bearing in mind that the meta is now fouling, then you can consider a biased referee a pretty solid pick because you need to stay at 11 players wherever possible. Dwarves are a unit. They're a little tank. They need to stay together. And therefore, 
biased referee is, is a reasonable pick. This is like defense and that is offense. So pick accordingly based on which one you need, defense or offense. From a star player's perspective, um, <laughs> Dwarves have uh, three, I think, very nice star players, uh, two of which are incredibly powerful, um, game-breakingly so in some respects. Uh, the first is Griff Overwald. If you need to win a specific game of Blood Bowl, you don't care about the consequences, you just want to go and win it, then look no further than Starman Griff. He is an absolute legend. He might break your heart, but he is very, very good. Uh, as discussed on previous videos, he is actually movement 10 because he's got sprint, sure feet and base movement of 7. Uh, so he reliably can move uh, 8, 9 or even 10 squares. He's strength 4 and he can dodge on a 2+, plus, so he's effectively old money, strength 4, edge 4. He can pass in a pinch uh, and he's pretty well armoured. Uh, he's also got the block and dodge skills, so getting him down is a challenge. And then on top of that, he also contains fend, which is brilliant. Uh, once they put the player skills in, uh, the once per games, Griff Overworld will let you re-roll any one particular re uh, dice, which will be amazing for dodging away from people like uh, for tackle or picking the ball up off the floor. Uh, he becomes even stronger, so at some point he will get even stronger than he already is. Gromidal, if you haven't quite got enough money for a, a Griff, then you can look at Grom. He's great. He uh, will hand out one skill per turn to somebody, and things like break tackle, mighty blow, um, are both very very strong. Um, I think he gives about short feet and sprint as well. So he, he, in a pinch, he can do um, some quite interesting mechanics. And I think from a star player point of view, he's an interesting star player. Uh, he's not quite in the same power category as Griff, but he is good. Barracks, Fair Blast, just while we're looking at this page, he's cheap. He's cheap for a reason. He's not very good. And the, there's just better picks out there. Avoid him pretty much at all costs. Uh, three of the final star players are Helmet Wolf, who... When you can get a bribe, why are you getting helmet? Um, I don't think there's any value here. Uh, Colavon kill. If your opponent has got no tackle and you want to add a little bit more beef to the situation, then look no further than Carla. She's great. She's strength four. She's edge three. And uh, she's block and she's dodge. Um, and she's also got jump up to try and get her back in the game if somehow she does get knocked over. So she's pretty good. And I think her and uh, Gromidal are interesting star players they're correctly tuned then we move into the final two we'll cover off mighty zug first uh, he is a is a human lineman who's had a couple of strength buffs but he is um block mighty blow strength five and again they've got three different options that sort of fill the 200k gold range and that gives you choices um griff is the best but he is the most expensive and then at a, the 200 210 220 range um, depending on what you're playing into, you might need a bit more strength, that's Zug. You might want a bit of strength with a bit of bludge, that's Carla. And then you might want a bit of utility, uh, that's Gromidol. However, if you have oodles of spare money, and you will, you're a dwarf, they don't die, they just mine money for fun, then look no further than the strongest star player in the game, which is Morgan Thorg, at strength 6, mighty blow plus 2, and block. Uh, you will be able to hire this guy a lot, and when you do, you'll make you'll make no more friends than you had when you turn up with your dwarf team in the first place. So, Morg is your go-to pick when you can afford him, and I suspect you'll be able to afford him probably every one in three or one in four games. That's everything from me. Thank you very much indeed for watching the guide video. I hope you've watched it all the way through. Uh, if you have, uh, what was your best bit? What was your worst bit? Um, please do leave a like and subscribe. It makes a huge difference uh, to the channel and it helps me reach other new players and hopefully when more people can enjoy Blood Bowl. Um, I've been Andy Davo, you've been great and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching.